Sunday. Oh, okay. So you're only here for like a day? Probably. Okay. Yeah. Well, like in class. Just today. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So today, talk about the question is something, you know, again, this class, we're going to cover more Sikhs of the Rebbe on the subject that are related to Mashiach, specifically related to Mashiach now in our generation, like what's unique about the times that we're in. So Rebbe keeps speaking about the fact that we're at the threshold, it's happening any moment. One of the questions that people ask is how can our generation be more worthy than all previous generations? So let me first explain the question and then we'll work on the answer. The basis of this question is that in Torah teachings, we look at the generations different than probably the way it's seen in the secular world. Generally speaking, we are much more advanced than any other generation previously. All the technology we have today, the knowledge of science we have today, so in general, people look at it that as the generations progress, people are smarter, more intelligent, and greater than people in the previous generations. But in the Torah world, we actually understand the opposite. The earlier back you go, the greater the people were spiritually. Uh, in other words, we have an era where there were prophets, people who were so righteous and so such spiritual giants that they were prophets. Hashem spoke to them. There were times where the Jewish people saw miracles. And, and then there was a time of those rabbis and sages that lived in the times of the first temple, the second temple, the sages who wrote the Mishnah, the sages who wrote the Gemara, could be was brought up in the halacha class, but each generation, as we move along, is considered spiritually inferior to the generation before. In fact, there are halachic ramifications of what I just now said. What are the halachic ramifications? That it's known that the sages who wrote the Mishnah are considered superior to the later sages who wrote the Gemara. They have a name. The ones who wrote the Mishnah are called Tanoim. The ones who wrote the Gemara are called Amarayim that if, a, if it's something is written in the Mishnah, then those sages, those who wrote the Gemara, will not argue against anything written in the Mishnah. They might argue how to interpret the Mishnah, how to understand the Mishnah, but it's so clear that the sages of the Mishnah are so much more superior that if they said something, then the later sages will not go against them. Now, if something's written in Gemara, then the sages who lived after the Gemara era, which is about 1,500 years ago, they're called Rishonim, they're called the early commentators. 
they will not argue against something which is written in Gemara. This is accepted by all rabbis and all circles of Torah that anything that's in Gemara is absolute halacha and nobody uh, from a later generation is qualified to disagree with them because they're so much more superior spiritually, intellectually than the later generation. And then there's another era which is called Achreinim, which means the later commentators. And they will not argue against those earlier commentators. In fact, the source for this is found in the Gemara itself. There's a statement in Gemara, which uh, on the surface is a little bit uh, strong, but this is a statement that's very well known. And this statement brings out this point that I just made. Just make a bracha on the water. Gemara says like this, this is in Gemara. If the rabbis of the earlier generations would be compared to angels, then we can compare ourselves to humans. If the rabbis in the early generations would be compared to humans, then we can compare ourselves to donkeys. But not like the donkey of Rav Pinchas ben Yoyer. Let me explain. So one of the sages in the Talmud, his name was Rav Pinchas ben Yoyer. If you're familiar with the name Rav Shum Bar Yochai, the one who wrote the Zohar, this sage Rav Pinchas ben Yoyer was his father-in-law, a sage of an even earlier generation. And there was an incident that his donkey was stolen. And a few days later, the donkey came back home by itself. And what was the story behind it? This story is in Gemara, that the people who stole the donkey were feeding the donkey, but they fed the donkey with, with um, this is Israel. So in Israel, there are certain halachas. You have to take a tenth of everything that grows on the field. Otherwise, you're not allowed to eat it. But a donkey is a donkey, you can give him anything. But this donkey was different. His master always gave him food that was kosher. Also for humans, was kosher for the animal. These people gave him regular food, so he didn't eat. They see the donkey's not eating, so they understood that if this keeps on going on for another few days, the donkey will be dead, so who needs it? And they let him go, and he came back home to his master. So the Gemara says, if the earlier sages are like humans, then we can think ourselves like donkeys, but not like that donkey, regular donkeys. What kind of statement is this? What does it mean? It means to say like this, just like the difference between angels and humans isn't just a difference in quantity, like they're smarter. When you talk about humans, you say this person is smarter than that person. This person is more qualified than the other person, more talented than the other person. This person is taller than another person, but they have something in common. They're both humans. An angel is a different caliber completely. And that's what the Gemara says. If we were to say that the earlier sages were like angels, then we're like humans compared to angels, which means they are in a different caliber completely in terms of their greatness. On the other hand, if you want to refer to the previous generations as great people, then we would consider ourselves like Donkeys, meaning to say, just like the difference between a donkey and a human being, is not a difference in quantity. A human being is smarter than a donkey. It's a different quality of existence, a different kind of identity completely. This is an animal, this is a human being. And that's how the earlier sages are greater than the, than, than the later sages. So following this order, that and what's the reason for this? How could you explain it? Why are the sages of early generation greater than the sages of the latest generation. <clears throat> so the answer is because the earlier you go back, in other words, Hashem created the world. So the first generation that was created directly by Hashem, Adam and Chava, they had a much more direct connection to Hashem. Their souls were greater. And every generation which is further away from the original creation spiritually is weaker than the preceding generation. So therefore, every generation spiritually is less than what was there before. We received the Torah. When we received the Torah, we saw and heard Hashem's voice. We saw godliness in this revealed way. That was the first generation. The second generation got it secondhand. The third generation got a third hand. So every generation, every following generation is spiritually weaker than the generation before. Yeah. So what about the generation that brings Mashiach since they're 
supposed to be. That's exactly where we're. Time. That's exactly where we're going. Great. You're on the same tracks as we are. Great minds think okay. <laughs> okay. So based on that, you say to yourself like this: There were these great sages, the greatest giants of Torah, like Rabbi Kiva, uh, and and all the others. We're not talking about one or two, tens of thousands of great sages that studied Torah, observed mitzvahs. Each one of them was a tzaddik in his own right, righteous people. And they did amazing things and they didn't merit to bring Mashiach. So we are gonna merit, we're, we're the, at the bottom of the, what are they called? The pole, the, the pole. right, we're at the bottom and we're gonna bring Mashiach. How does that make sense? If they weren't qualified to bring Mashiach, how could we be qualified to bring Mashiach? That's the question. And again, to understand the question, we have to preface that the reason why we are in Golis, why there's such a thing as exile in the first place was we had a base of Mikdash, things were very different, but because we didn't conduct ourselves properly, in other words, spiritually, we violated the Torah, so we lost that privilege to have the base of Mikdash. It's like a person who's perfectly healthy, but then they do things that does, it damages, does, da it does damage to their health, and as a result of that, they can no longer function in a healthy way, in a regular way. And they have to go to a hospital. They have to go through a rehab. They have to go through a whole process to be healthy again, to be able to get back on their feet. So spiritually, we were healthy. And then because of our sins, spiritually, we caused spiritual damage to ourselves. And the gullus is not just a punishment. The gullus is a process of refinement, a process of correction. It's a process of healing. And once we're completely healed, then we have the base of English. So the early generations, with the amount of Torah that they studied, with the righteousness that they had, all together, they still did not merit to bring Mashiach. How can we say that we were so much more, we're inferior to them, and yet we're the ones that are going to bring Mashiach? That's the obvious question. Yep. So I'm wondering, though, because like, for me, like, it seems like there's like an obvious answer that obvious question like it like doesn't make sense initially like you're at the bottom of the pool how do you like bring in the chef like if if we know what a totem pole looks like and you know that they're like a lot of wooden heads on top of each other you would never have the top without the bottom because you slowly build them up so it would make sense that the bottom plays like, a crucial role in carrying the whole like totem pole to like the chef to where you want to be you're on target so that's the answer uh, but I'll give you the answer as it's brought down in Torah commentators. And they use these words. We're soon going to see this inside. I'll read a little bit inside. They use the word that's like the midget standing on a giant's so shoulders. A giant who's very tall, he could see far away. A midget, tiny little guy, he can't see. But if the midget is standing on the giant's shoulder, he could see very far. In fact, he could even see further than the giant himself. Does that mean that the midget is greater than the giant? No. Because the reason why he could see so far, and the reason why he can even see further than the giant is because he's standing on the giant's shoulders. So in other words, we're just saying, what I'm saying is the same thing, that when we say that we will merit to bring Mashiach, it's not because we are superior to them. It's because of them, after all the work that the first generation did, then the second generation did, then the third generation did, and all the work was done by all the great righteous people throughout all the generations, we now at the end come and we do whatever we do, the little things that we do, and that will bring Mashiach as a result of because it's after all the good was accumulated from all the previous generations of the good that was done. To use another muscle, Today with technology, we have more new mashalim that we didn't have in the olden days. Think of a computer. Today you have a computer. If you have to uh, try to figure out something mathematical, a little kid can get on the computer and click on a few buttons here and there. And he can figure things out that years ago would have taken a team of mathematicians and spend who knows a week or two weeks figuring it out. And now this little kid can do it in no time. Does that mean that he's much smarter than them? Of course not. Because they were brilliant people. And these brilliant people put together what we have today as a computer, which also didn't happen at once. 
first it was one way, then it was better, and then every generation or every few years it's improved. And now we have this state-of-the-art computer, and now all you need to do is click on a button and you get this, that, and the other thing. So yes, little children could do things today that years ago the most brilliant people couldn't do, the most talented people couldn't do. With the computer, you can do it. Why? Because of all those people that were brilliant that put together this piece of technology. So the same thing is also spiritually. We don't know have to do as much as they did, but the little bit that we do will bring Mashiach because it comes after all the good that they've done. So we should also add that anything good that's done, if it's a mitzvah, it's a positive thing, it's eternal. Even though it was done a thousand years ago, a hundred years ago, 500 years ago, spiritually, whatever it accomplished and whatever it was, it, it exists forever because it's something godly and something spiritual and it's eternal. So that means that every single thing that was done that was good, every thought, every speech, every action of every person, man, woman, and child throughout all the generations, it all adds up and accumulates. It's not gone, it's still there. And then we come with that last thing with the click on the computer and, and that's it. It's like somebody would press the button that sends a rocket ship, a spaceship out to outer space. They don't have to be very smart. They just have to press a button. If all the work was done by all the scientists and now all you do is you press this button and there he goes, it's out of space. So that's how we are. We're just pressing the, the final buttons that comes after all the work that was done. But the term that's used, this is the most common term that's used in, 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 in the Torah world is it's the mushal of the midget standing on the shoulders of the giant. Let's look inside. There's a book we have it in the library, and that's a lot of the material we're using in this class comes from that book. It's called Migoila Le Geula, from Exile to Redemption. And it's basically a compilation of different sources on the subject of Mashiach. We have the check. We'll do the one that has the check on it. Goodness and holiness are eternal. When a Jew fulfills a mitzvah in the upper spheres, this union between the soul and God is eternal. Which is, by the way, one of the reasons why doing a mitzvah one time is so precious. There's a lot of people that you might hear them criticize the idea of mitzvahim. You speak to a woman and you say to her, maybe you want to light candles to Shabbos. Or you speak to a man, maybe you want to put on tefillin. What if there's no follow-up? They'll never put on tefillin again. She'll never light candles again. Is there any, any uh, worth, any real, uh, thing, anything to gain from just one time doing it? It's not something she's going to take on as a way of life. So the answer is yes. And not just something, but something eternal. When a person does a mitzvah, it creates a certain connection with Hashem. And because Hashem is above time, so that connection is eternal, it is there forever. Even though down here it took one minute and it was only one time, but spiritually it's eternal. Evil, by contrast, has no existence. It is no more than a concealment of the divine light. Hence, when a person is punished for a sin and this cleanses, or when he repents, the evil ceases to exist. Basically, the point here is that all the good that was done accumulates. All the bad that was done doesn't accumulate. Why not? Not being fair. No. Because when you do something negative, it gets erased. It gets, it gets uh, if a person does tshuva, it's cleansed. If a person goes through some kind of suffering, we know the suffering is not a punishment. It's a process of cleansing. It's a process of, of healing. So whether it goes through something in this world, it goes through something in that world, it's a process of healing where the negativity is erased, is deleted. So basically, all the negative things that were done in the past are no longer here. But holiness and godliness and mitzvahs, those are things that are eternal. So everything that was ever done is still here and more and more is added. And therefore, we have all this good accumulated. Since good is eternal, all the accumulated good of all the past generations still exists. And this is why now specifically we will soon be privileged to witness the coming of Mashiach, even though the superficial appearance might indicate that the generation is unworthy. 
you turn the page. Let's turn two pages. It says a dwarf on the shoulders of a giant. Again, we have the check. Early Jewish ethical writers like to use the analogy of the dwarf who could see further than the giant because he's standing on the shoulders of the giant. Our present generation is dwarfed by the gigantic stature of the earlier generations who were like sons of angels. It's an expression from the Gemara that I mentioned before. Nevertheless, since the spiritual labors of our generation follow the accomplishments of the previous generation, Therefore, it is this generation's labors, the work that we do, which will be rewarded by the future redemption. At the same time, it should be clear that the dwarf's vantage point was not earned by his own effort. It was the giant who perched him there. And therefore, there's no point in asking whether it's reasonable that the dwarf could be up there since, after all, the generation is unworthy because the Almighty arranged it so that we should be coming and following chronologically after the previous generations so we can accomplish things that they weren't able to accomplish. But it shouldn't make a person feel arrogant. Wow, so I'm greater than those great sages? No, the reason why I can do what I can do is because of those great sages, and I'm just doing the final touches, tying the loose ends, as they say. Any questions? Everybody agrees. Okay. I do. I do have a question. Isn't there um, a concept that when Mashiach comes, or just before, that children will be teaching their parents, meaning that the last generation before Mashiach will be greater than the one just prior to it? The fact that the children will be teaching their parents still doesn't mean that they were greater sages or greater, you know, spiritually. It just means we'll be witnessing a time that the parents will be inspired by their own children because the parents themselves moved away from Torah mitzvahs and the children will embrace Torah mitzvahs. So that's something which we're witnessing today. But what you could say is that years ago, there was no, uh, first of all, there wasn't such, so many people that distanced themselves from Judaism. And we didn't see such a sort of global movement of tshuva as we see today. So that part is, yes, there is an advantage. There's something happening now that didn't happen before. But if we say that we need to be worthy to bring Mashiach, in terms of worthiness and in terms of greatness, we would imagine that whatever we do with our davening, learning, or mitzvahs, it, it can't compare at all to the davening, the Torah, the mitzvahs, the accomplishments of previous generations. So it's not a contradiction to say that there's something in our generation which is different or better than before there is. But in general, we are spiritually weaker than they were. So if they couldn't do it, how could we do it? So the answer is with their power. Yeah. Doesn't it also say that like, where a Belchuda stands, even a Sadiq can't stand? Right. Because there's so many more in our generation. Does that have any sort of impact as well? Yeah, it definitely has an impact. It definitely has an impact because tshuva is something which is very powerful. And there never was a generation like ours that, that was, we see so much tshuva. There's no question that that would, has an impact. But still, if you would have a, a true understanding of the greatness of those great people, the ones who wrote the Mishnah, the ones who wrote the Talmud, after all, they, they are the source of the entire oral Torah, still... What we do is no comparison to, to their greatness. And I guess that's why it uses the analogy of a person, an animal, a, an angel, to show that it's a different caliber completely. Wait, Rabbi Majeski, is the idea... Yeah. yeah, yeah. Who, who should ask, me from the screen or is someone in class speaking? No, you. Okay, um, so... Is the idea that with every single generation, there's a slight lessening of spiritual greatness? Or is the idea yes. that the stages were really great and then there was a big drop off and it kind of plateaued from there? Or that literally like my grandparents were spiritually greater than me. Their, 
And then my parents were spiritually greater than me, though less so than my grandparents. And then, generally like, speaking, yes, that their spiritual potential, they might not have been greater in actuality, but their spiritual potential in every earlier generation is greater than the later generation. Hmm. When you study Tanya, you have a deeper understanding of this, although I don't want to go into it in depth now, but in Tanya it explains that the spiritual capacity of every soul is different because it comes from a different uh, source in the spiritual realm. So every generation, the spiritual source of the souls is from a step lower. And it's not because Hashem is not being fair, but it's because that is what's necessary for that generation. Mm -hmm. It's like in the human body, we have different organs and the brain its function is superior to the hands, the feet, but the hands and the feet are necessary and they contribute something to the body that the brain and the heart can contribute. So therefore, every organ is important. Every organ contributes what it is, but nevertheless, some are more sort of qualified than the others. And that's how it is with the souls. We definitely are doing something that wasn't done before, but generally the spiritual potential of each generation is one step less than the generation prior to it. Yeah. It's not saying that we're weak, like as a, or is it saying that as each generation- Spiritually, a certain- I feel like so, like to come back to, to religion, like being, like following Mitzvah is really hard. Like, it, it is really hard, like coming from secular world, like it feels, to me, it feels like we're like crawling out of this like pit of like lies and and disbelief and like and like evidence of religion not being true. So I feel like it's like we're really strong to come back to it. Again, there's, there's no doubt that this movement of chuva. It's something which is greater than people who just grew up with this and live with this and so on and so forth. But it's, and, and that is part of the merit why, why we're bringing Mashiach. You're right. That is part of the reason why this generation is bringing Mashiach. But after all, everything said and done, well, if we would have a better understanding, and maybe as we go along learning more, a better understanding of the greatness of those great people, it still would be hard to understand, and especially when you think of generations that people actually gave up their lives physically, burnt by the stake, were drowned in, in, in water, what happened with the Jews, with the Nazis, all these kind of things that people went through, you know, in, in Russia, in Poland, in, in Babylon, in, in Rome, that they went through in order to hold on to their Judaism, in some ways that was beyond our you know wildest imagination that we would be able to do things like that sometimes we think would i act that way in those days so there's greatness there and that that seems the only true explanation why their greatness didn't bring it ours is because their greatness did bring it and we and our greatness is the final touches <laughs> okay so now we're going to go to another subject yes um I'm wondering, like, because, like, are we the generation that brings because of just the timeline in general? Like, because there's, like, the 6,000 year timeline and we're getting really close to that. Like, I feel like that's easier for me to conceptualize than, like, this is, like, why are we, like, the generation? Like, that's what we're talking about, right? Like, right, but when you talk about. Be more worthy, but it's like, but I'm wondering, like, is it a question of, like, how are we more worthy, or is it just, like, that's how it was planned, was it's almost 6,000 years, and sometime now. Right, so we're going to learn about that in a later class, that it's brought down that the two possibilities how Mashiach can come. One is this designated time, and the other is we can hasten, we can sort of expedite the process by being more worthy. Mm -hmm. So our question is, yes, when the time comes, it's the time came. Yeah. But we're talking about, let's learn more, let's dive in more, let's be more kind to one another, let's obviously throw, and through that we'll expedite the process, so one could laugh and say, come on, if they couldn't expedite the process, how could we? So we're talking about expediting the process early, like I told you, you know, with the, uh, with, uh, <clears throat> with redeeming your points, they call it early redemption. Uh, so this is the early redemption. 
And the early redemption for that is a matter of being worthy. And our question is, weren't they more worthy? And now the second part of this lesson is about this question. We might need more time for this. But one of the things that are, it's a cornerstone of the Rebbe's teachings is that the thing that brings Mashiach sooner, one of the things that ex, that uh, hasten Mashiach's coming is the spreading of Hasidus specifically. There's no doubt that any good deed has an effect on tipping the scale, but it's this mitzvah or another mitzvah, Torah study, any good deed that anybody does. In fact, the term that's always used, any good act, any good word, and any good thought has an effect on, on tipping the scale. But there are certain things that are specifically very powerful, have a tremendous impact on hastening coming of Mashiach. And one of them is the spreading of chassidus. The question is why? How do we understand it? What's the source for it and why? So let's see how much we'll cover today and the rest will cover next week. So I'm going to skip the first page and the second page. I'll, I'll go back to it later. It's based on this, this story. At the top of the page, you should say um, 71, page 71, the light of Mashiach. When your wellsprings will be disseminated outward. So it writes, the Bachshemta writes in a letter that on Rosh Hashanah of the year 5507, which is 1746, his soul ascended to the heavenly realms where he was granted the privilege of entering the palace or the chamber of Mashiach. And then he writes, I asked Mashiach, Master, when are you coming? And he replied, when your wellsprings will be disseminated outward. Now this expression, when your wellspring will be disseminated outward is a verse, it's a pasuk, and that's the first page. Let's go back to the beginning, the first page. So it's a verse in the book of Proverbs, and it says these words, Yafutsu Mainasecha Chutza Berchevis Palyamayim. It's underlined in English. Your springs, your wellsprings, which means your wisdom will be spread all the way out. So that's what he told the Bachshamta. When your teachings, which is the teachings of Hasidim, will be spread out, that's when Mashiach will come. So um, on this exchange, Rebbe Rayat commented, Rebbe Rayat is the previous Rebbe, from this reply it is apparent that the teachings of the Bachshamta the revelation of the divine intellect which the Shemtev and his disciples and their disciples bequeath us are very closely connected with the coming of Mashiach. Mashiach is an atzmi. Okay, this part we'll have to leave because that's too complicated. But the teachings and the spreading of the teachings of Hasidus that has to do with bringing Mashiach. And the question is why? In other words, there's two ways to interpret the answer. One way is that it's a sign. When you see that the wellsprings of Hasidus are being spread, which means what we said in last week's class, that one of the signs of this generation, being the generation of Mashiach, is that before Mashiach comes, the teachings of Kabbalah and teachings of mysticism will be out there. And there's never been a time in history, like today and like now, that the teachings of Kabbalah and the mystical teachings of the Torah are so accessible as it is today. If you remember, we showed a, a source in the Zohar that should be lesson number two in your booklets, where the Zohar writes that before Mashiach comes, people will be knowledgeable and people will have access to the teachings of mysticism and Kabbalah. And there's never such a time like today. So is this a sign or is this part of the reason why it's happening? Certain things are not, it's not the reason, it's just a sign. Like if you're traveling on a highway and it says, um, welcome to New York, the sign is just an indication that you've arrived in New York. It has nothing to do with you getting there, it's just a sign, something external. So is this just a sign that when you see that people are studying Hasidus, that's a sign that we're in the era of Mashiach? Or is, or is this something that causes Mashiach to come? It's not just a sign. A woman is in labor, and the doctor says that this is an indication that the baby will be born soon. It's more than just a sign. It means this is the process itself is now taking place. 
So basically, the spreading of Hasidus is something which is instrumental in bringing Mashiach. How? Let's see if we have the time to explain it. You know what? I'll say something now orally, and then next time we do this, I'll, I'll read from inside and tell you what it says here. It's going to be easier that way, and we'll have a chance to just give over the general idea. We're going to be discussing this a lot. We talk a lot about what's going to happen when Mashiach comes. People will be healthy. People will be happy. There won't be any Tzahara. There won't be any wars. The nations will get along with each other. The nations and the Jewish people will get along with all these wonderful, amazing things. But there's one thing that's sort of behind all these amazing things. There's one major thing that's going to happen and change. And in fact, that one change is going to change everything else. What is that one change? The one change is that Hashem's presence, which is here in the world now, but totally concealed and hidden, when Mashiach comes, his presence will be revealed. And as a result of that, all the other changes will take place. The best analogy I could think of it is like a person who, God forbid, was in an accident. As a result of that, they're in a coma. And as a result of that, they're not speaking, they're not walking, they're not going to work, they can't communicate with their friends, with their relatives, and all the unfortunate things that are happening. But it's only a result of one thing, that the person is unconscious. Then if the doctor comes along and is able to cure this person, and they come back to consciousness, with a short time, they get out of bed, they're walking and talking, and back, go back to work, back to what everything was there before, because they came back to consciousness. In a sense, the whole world today, spiritually, is like unconscious. In fact, it, the metaphor is used in different places in Torah. It's like sleeping, meaning unconscious. Hashem's presence is here, otherwise it wouldn't exist, but it's unconscious. And as a result of that, there's all these negative things happening in the world. When Mashiach comes and Hashem is revealed, it's like the person who comes back to consciousness, he comes back to perfect health again. So everything in life, everything in the world will be positive. The good in humans will come out, the good in animals will come out, the good in the world will come out, the good in all the nations of the world will come out, the, girl, the good in the weather will come out, whatever you want, the good in it will come out in the open because anything negative is God and is concealed. <laughs> one, more, no, one more line. So basically, the teachings of Hasidus is the first step in starting to reveal godly light in the world. But in Hasidus, it's revealing it intellectually, academically. And that is a sort of a prerequisite and an orientation that by revealing godliness academically in Torah, eventually this will lead that godliness will be revealed in actuality. And that is what Mashiach is all about. Godliness, Hashem's presence being revealed in the world. Yes, Ariel. I guess I answered my question just by thinking, but I guess it's like... It's a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> but I guess, I was wondering if it like literally bad things will stop happening or by learning the Siddhas, we judge, learn to judge favorably and we learn no, to like see literally, all the good things. No, literally life, bad then, things will stop happening, which means there'll come a time where there won't be any bad people, there won't be any illness, there won't be any sickness, there won't be any wars. And a lot of the things are already happening that actually things are changing compared to the way they used to be. And, uh, you know, people are living longer, people will live longer or People to will live forever, but these are things that are are we're talking about. They'll be good in a way that we see it, not that we'll interpret it as good or we'll have a better judgment. Uh, actually, all the evil and negativity that we see now will no longer be because Hashem will be revealed, and that Hashem revealed means goodness revealed. So I'm going to be out of a job. What? I'm going to be out of a job. Why I'm not you? mad at it. You'll be, <laughs> I'm going to be retired. You'll work in the maternity home for you. <laughs> help women give birth. Yeah, I like that. The Rebbe once told the doctor, who told him, what's going to be, Mashiach comes, I'm going to lose my job. So he says, you'll be into preventive medicine, keeping people healthy. Yeah. It sounds like sort of boring. <laughs> it sounds what? Boring. Like, I don't know, like, if you think about it, like, it's kind of like, like, Adam and Chava, like, everything was perfect. Like, I don't know, like, 
to such a perfect world, wouldn't that sort of like cause chaos almost? Or is it because we you see Mashiach that will be like, oh, okay, I can I do it perfect? Like, what's the point of even living at that point? If there's like no ups and downs and no like, like there'll be how do we know it's good? So the answer is there's gonna be ups and downs, there'll be challenges, but at that time. Instead of the challenges being going from bad to good, they'll be going from good to better. In other words, it's like saying, if a person is healthy, so life is boring. No, it's not boring. And there's so much to do. I can build my health. I can become more talented, become a better athlete. Whatever it is, I can do better and better and grow. In fact, everyone wants to grow, but growing doesn't mean that there's something bad going on. I'm growing from good to better. And being that Hashem is infinite, there's no end, and the excitement will continue all along. Rabbi Majeski, I have a question, which is, yeah. is, there, is there a concept that, um, you know, during like the birthing pains of Mashiach coming and when these bad things start happening more and more as they already have been, that each of us also individually will experience bad things that are more personal to us? Like, will we each have our personal birthing pains that has less to do with like a collective negative experience, which would also happen, but more like personally negative things as well? Yes, uh, but it happened already. We don't need any more to happen. We've been there, done that. Now we need Mashiach. <laughs> um, yes, when we talk about this sort of last, last moments of concealment, it's the world at large and on everybody on a personal level as well. Mm -hmm. So maybe that's why there's such a mental health crisis. Maybe that, maybe that's why we have COVID now. Maybe that's why we have anything that's negative now that we didn't have before. It's part of the, the last, the last, the last uh, movement, so to speak, before Hashem is revealed. And I have one other question, which is that once Mishkiah comes and everyone is risen from the dead, um, will everybody just be like hanging out on earth together? And will we still eat food? And will there still be stores? Like how much will life look? I mean, yeah, well, we still, I mean... We're going to have lessons. We're going to specifically discuss that time period. Okay. Yes, in general, it's going to be the same world we're in today. But, uh, of course, it'll be different in the sense it'll be just good and not the bad. But it'll be a physical world. Yeah. Everybody, a good Shabbos to you. All the best. Good Shabbos. Yeah. I'm not going to be able to do that. I'm not going to be able to do that. I'm not going to be able to do that. I'm not going to be able to do that. I'm not going to be able to do that. I'm not going to be able to do that. I'm not going to be able to do that. I'm not going to be able to do that